Python 3.12 has introduced a new, much better syntax for generic types. And since I'm a type junkie, I obviously have to cover it in the video. So today we're going to find out how generic types in Python work and what the advantage is over just using the any type. Let's dive in. Python has had type annotations since 3.5. They were added with pep 484. Now, type annotations are great, but you can make them more generic by using generic types. And that allows you to have even more precision in the types of objects that you're dealing with. And you've probably already used them before if you're using some of the existing types in Python. For example, a list of integers or a dictionary mapping a string to another type. For example, let's say you have a function that's called process numbers and that gets a list of numbers and then, for example, also returns another list of numbers. Now the list type has a generic component because it allows you to specify what types of elements are in the list. And by writing int between the square brackets behind the list type, we now specify this is a list of integers and not of strings or booleans or anything else. One of the reasons we expect a list of numbers of integers here is that we're doing some arithmetic operations, which, you know, if we got a list of random objects, we wouldn't be able to do object plus one. But you can also imagine that there are some functions that work with lists that are generic. Let's say we have a, a process elements, which gets elements and that's a list of some type t and it also returns another list of that particular type t and then it might return the elements uh, at uh, odd indices for example and then it simply does this right so when you look at a function like this now oh, let's ignore the type errors for a moment actually it doesn't matter what the type is of the thing that's in the list because we're simply returning the elements in the odd indices. We don't care. This function works for a list of integers. It works for a list of foo bars. It works for a list of strings. It doesn't matter what is in the list. The only thing we do is we return elements at the odd indices. So it would be a pity if we had to define this function for every type of list that we're going to use. We simply want to say, hey, this is for any element. We don't really care about it. We just wanted to return elements at odd indices. We don't care what's in the list. And this is where generics can be very helpful. But how do we specify that this is a generic type? Because at the moment we're getting a T is not defined error. Well, that's where in the past you had to use type vars for. So we simply write T equals type var T. And type var is something that we're going to import from typing. So now t is a generic type and we can use it in a function like so. And the nice thing now is that I can create a list of integers like so. And then I can do uh, processed equals and then I want to do process elements and then we print the processed list. So when I run this code, then we're going to get this the elements at the odd indices, which are actually the even numbers. So that's slightly confusing. But what we can do is now we have a my string list. And then actually we can do exactly the same and we get as an output a list of strings. Now that you see how awesome generic type annotations are, you probably want to use them more in your code. But the question is, where are you going to host your application? And the answer is on the VPS by today's sponsor Hostinger, of course. You got full root access, dedicated IP address. They support multiple operating systems, including various Linux distributions and much more. The VPS is hosted using powerful hardware such as NVMe, SSD storage, and AMD Epic processors. And with KVM virtualization, your VPS can benefit from separate resources, which leads to better performance and stability. There's a great Black Friday offer for the VPS KVM2 plan at the moment. For the 12 or 24 month subscription, you pay only $6.99 per month. That's a 63% discount. And if you use the discount code, Arion Codes, you get an additional 10% off. So don't forget to use that. You start by selecting a location for your VPS. 
So I'm based in the Netherlands, so let's select the Netherlands. And then you can choose what kind of VPS you want. So do you want an OS with a control panel, just a plain operating system, or do you want to use a content management system like WordPress? I'm going to pick OS with control panel because for me that's a bit easier to manage. So I'm going to pick Ubuntu, then simply click continue. Now we can create a panel password. We also pick a root password. If you want to access your server remotely, you can already provide an SSH key right in the setup process. So here's my setup and now we simply click finish setup and in a few minutes your VPS is ready to go. With 24 seven support from the team, you'll never feel lost. And with a 30 day money back guarantee, you can try them out risk free. Click the link in the description to get started. And now let's go back to the video. I might wonder why do we need generic types? Uh, why can't we just use any, right? So let me show you what happens if you use any instead of generic types. So first thing that I want to show you is that list, the IDE indicates that list is a list of integers, right? Makes sense because we're assigning it a list of integers. Now process elements gets a list with elements of type T and returns also a list of elements with type T. So that means that if I pass it my list, which is a list of integers, then processed is also a list of integers. And the IDE knows that because process elements has that return type, right? And here my string list is a list of strings. Process elements is called with a list of strings. And then process now is a list of strings, which the IDE also knows because of the type annotation used in process elements. So that's very useful. Now, if you were to use any instead of this generic type, so let me change that. So we would simply do that and then also replace it there. Now, actually, we don't need the type var anymore. So you would say, okay, great, right? Works in exactly the same way, except that's not true. Because now if you look at my list, so that's a list of integers, but processed is now a list of any. It's no longer a list of integers, at least not according to the IDE. So that means we've lost a lot of information. And same here, we have the string list, process elements gets a string list, but it returns a list of any. So now we no longer know that process now has a list of strings. Even worse, the specification of the type here doesn't say anything at all about how this list and that list is related. Perhaps process elements gets a list of integers and returns a list of strings. We have no way to know that. Whereas with a generic type, you can indicate no, the type of the elements in the list that you put in is exactly the same as the type of the elements in the list that comes out. And that's the main difference between using a generic type versus using any. Any just switches off type annotations, basically. It tells the type system to just ignore whatever the thing is, because it can be anything. Now, the issue with type vars is that it's kind of cumbersome to have to define a type var every time you need to use a generic type. But with Python 3.12, that actually all changes. So I'm going to show you another example. So here I have a before version where I'm still using the old style type vars. So here I'm specifying a type var T just like in the previous example. And then I'll come back to this later. So here we have an example of a generic function that gets a list of items and then returns one of the items from the list. And similarly, you can also use typed vars together with generics for classes. So for example, here I have a class box that's a generic class and that gets a type T. And what this does, it's just a container for an object of type T. So we have an initializer where we store something of type T. And then we have get item that gets that particular item and we have a set item. It's kind of useless class, but just to show how generic types actually work in Python. But this is how you had to do it, right? So you had your class and then you had to inherit from a generic type and then you could specify the actual type that's going to be used in the class itself. That's how it worked. And similarly, now that you have the type for, you can also specify a type alias like a uh, list or set, for example, and then you could s say that uh, it's a list of T or it's a set of T. Before Python 3.12, if you want to have a generic type alias like this list or set, you need to add this part to the definition or it won't work. So in general, this is how we were dealing with generic types before Python 3.12. And then you can use them in a very simple way. So we have an integer box so that works just fine. We do get item that gives us an integer, right? Because get item is generic and we know the type T is an integer and then we can print that. 
and it also works for strings. We can even create a box containing a list, it doesn't matter. And here's a simple example of calling that generic function. And then also here we know that the type of first item is of type int because we're passing it a list of integers. Then, well, let me run this. It's not very interesting, but this is what it prints. So that's before Python 3.12. But with Python 3.12, we no longer need type vars, and there's also a much easier way of specifying type aliases. And we also no longer need the generic type. So let's see what that looks like. So here's what that looks like in Python 3.12. So here's an example of a non-generic type alias. The difference is that we write type in front of it. So here's the before version. We do it like that. And the after version, we have the type keyword in front of it. And for a generic type alias, we simply specify, again, using the type keyword, we provide the name, and then we write the generic type in square brackets behind it. So list or set is now a generic type that is either a list of t or a set of t. So it's a bit more coherent than how we had to do it before, where here we could simply define a type, but here we had to specify it as a type alias. It's the same now. It's just type in front of it and then assign it the type that you want the alias to be. Also, we no longer need the generic type in a class definition. So here's another version of that same box class. So here, let me show you what it looked like before. So it inherits from the generic class and then that we provide the type t. So that indirection is now gone. We can simply write the class name and we write the type behind it in square brackets. And for the rest, it all works exactly the same way. And for generic function, we can now also supply the type in square brackets behind the function name. I'm getting some type error here. I'm still encountering some issues with pylands in VS Code, unfortunately. I think there are some bugs with how it detects generic types, so I hope they will uh, solve that soon. But this is basically how you do it. And then for the rest, it works in exactly the same way as before. So we can simply create our integer box, and then int box is of type box integer. Our item is an integer. We can print that, so it works in exactly the same way. And when we run this, then we also get exactly the same output, obviously. I must say I much prefer the newer syntax over the old syntax. It's much cleaner, much simpler. We don't need extra imports to deal with generic types. Another useful thing that you can do with generic types is that you can define so-called upper bounds. So what that means is that you can restrict a generic type to a particular subtype. Here's a simple example. I have a vehicle data class that has one member variable model, simply displays a message when we call the display method. And then I have a car, and I have a boat, and I have a third class called a plane. Actually, this should be three. Big problem in the code, right? But now let's say we want to have a sort of registry of vehicles, and we want to be able to add vehicles and uh, display some information about those vehicles. So that's vehicle registry. And I'm using a generic class. So this is the pre-Python 3.12 mechanism of defining a generic class. And that relies on a type var v. And what I'm doing here is that I'm defining an upper bound vehicle. So basically what I'm saying here is that if you have a vehicle registry, generic class, you supply the type of thing that that is the type that it relies on, but that type is bound to vehicle. So it has to be vehicle or a subclass of vehicle. You can't make a vehicle registry with something that's not a vehicle class. And here's how you use that. So let's say we have a registry here, which is a vehicle registry of cars. And then I'm going to add a few different cars and display car information. Now, because this is a car vehicle registry, I can't add a boat to it. If I try to do that, you see that we now get an error. Actually, boat is incompatible with car. You can't drive a boat on the road, right? But what you can do is define a registry that accepts any type of vehicle by simply supplying this as a type. And then we can add cars and boats. So the upper bound is vehicle or any of its subclasses. But if I now create a class coffee machine, what I can do is create a coffee machine registry and use the vehicle registry for that because coffee machine is not a vehicle. You can't drive a coffee machine. So this doesn't work. And that's what the upper bound does. But defining the upper bound is, again, using type files, which is a bit cumbersome. But in Python 3.12, this also becomes a lot easier. Because here, we have the same thing. It's the vehicle class. 
we have the vehicle subclasses. I removed the coffee machine here because we don't need it. But the vehicle registry is now a generic class based on V and V is bound to vehicle. So that defines the upper bound. So this works in exactly the same way as the other example, but now we're using Python 3.12's generics. Again, unfortunately, I'm still running into a few issues here with PyLand, so the type reporting is a bit off, but this is how it works. And you can see that when I run this, we get exactly the same output. And by the way, these upper bounds are pretty flexible, so you can even specify multiple upper bounds by defining a tuple. So for example, here we have our vehicle registry, which again is generic type, but now we're using a tuple to tell it that you can create a vehicle registry of cars and of boats, but not of planes, for example, or anything else. So you can specify multiple options, multiple constraints for your types using a tuple. By the way, if you like these types of nerdy type discussions, you might also like my Discord server. You can join for free by going to discord.arian.codes. There's a lot of really knowledgeable, helpful people there. So discord.arian.codes, I've also put the link in the description of the video. So overall, I like generic types quite a lot because they allow us for a lot of flexibility in how we define our types. And we can be pretty precise with how we define them. Now you would use them mostly in container-like situations where you would create, let's say, a list-like structure or a dictionary-like structure and you want it to be generic. That's where generic types can really help a lot. And that's as opposed to something like any, which simply switches off the type system. So that's quite different. It also makes your code more reusable because you don't have to write multiple functions that do exactly the same thing, but with just a slightly different type. You can use generic types for that. And by using the generics mechanism, your IDE also still understands what type of things you're dealing with. I do think there's always a trade-off though in how far you're gonna go with this because if you really go in deeply, you can get pretty complex types by using generics and upper bounds, constraints, and those kinds of things. And it can become quickly pretty hard to understand what a type exactly is. So you have to be also careful about how you do that. And again, also in type specifications, design principles also rear their head, right? Uh, you don't want to put a really complex type in a single huge type alias. You might want to split that up into smaller type aliases so you do understand what is going on. Now, Python and its ecosystem is still pretty opportunistic in how it uses type specifications. They're not in all the libraries, for example, as opposed to language like TypeScript, which really focuses on making sure the types are always there, but that can also lead down a rabbit hole where you're trying to fix some very esoteric type issue, which actually doesn't really have any impact on the final application. So you have to know sort of where to stop and not dive in too deep because you're going to lose yourself. But I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about this. Do you use generic types in your code? How important is type precision to you? Maybe it's not important at all. Let me know in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this deeper dive into Python 3.12's generic type system. If you want to learn more about other features that Python 3.12 introduced, and there are quite a few, some of them are quite interesting, you should definitely watch this video next. Thanks for watching and see you soon.